Today's podcast is brought to you by Tetra Hearing. Tetra Hearing isn't just hearing protection, it's hearing perfection. This cool weather felt nice the last couple of days. It'd be oh, 100 God. degrees again next it week. Awesome. <laughs> Put a sweatshirt on this morning. It was I awesome. Now there was ducks flying all over yesterday and oh, hearing God, stuff. Yeah, it was freaking awesome. Even this morning coming down. It felt a little bit like duck season, and then next week it's going to feel like summer again. Well, it was mm-hmm. like cloudy skies, Montana's, there was yeah. a tornado going off the road. It was like, all right, man. <laughs> it's all awesome. happening. Yeah, Montana's way ahead. <laughs> yeah. When I drove by that the other day, they were flooding up. And they were cutting, chiseling, chopping, flooding. Yeah. And yeah, they had a lot of water going there two days ago. Yeah, on time Sunday. of the year. So. Why are some spots so early? They just get their stuff planted in. Just they were, they were dirt. Gotcha. They can get on it easy. It's lighter soil. Okay. That's a lot of the guys over there on the west side. It's light. You get a little sandy loam. You know, there's more sand in it. So gotcha. it goes quicker. What's so, the percentage of rice on the ground like this year compared to last year or normal? Well, we're 400, about 448,000 acres. And last year we were 520. Oh, wow. So there's 70,000 because of the rain. Gotcha. It, it should have been more. There was guys that were still planting in June, getting them in. <laughs> I don't know why they did that. Didn't take their insurance, but they decided they wanted to. They wanted to plant, and just hoping know. for the right weather the to rice. make it. Now well, they sit there and they want the right. They think the price is going to rally, but it won't. Gotcha. It's there's a there's there's a good supply of rice in the system still. Hmm. So, I think the world worked through it this year, but but the good thing is the tree crops are rebounding. So <clears throat> they both they kind of. They kind of, when one's up, the other one goes down. And we've seen that with rice will go up, nuts are way low, and then the nuts will come back up and the rice goes down. And that's why we lost all that rice ground. Guys were planting trees because the walnuts and the almonds were doing so well. Rice yeah. sucked. So they were yanking rice out, planting trees on it. And then here a couple of years ago, guys were taking trees out. And I was going to say, <laughs> is it just an endless cycle? Well, it was $40 the- rice. I mean, you freaking not to yeah you know? that's but it lasted one year it's well like, we actually had a ramp up and then we hit that peak and we just thought that that price of rice was going to hang for a couple of years because they were saying two to three years and um and then it just slid back down to 10 bucks wow you know Jeez. and it was below production cost so that's crazy yeah it's a it's it's that's a roller coaster it, to be well, on well, i couldn't the, imagine the rice is the problem too because you're dealing with such large acreage you know that's the problem, hmm. and the and the and the inflation with all the cro- the costs went up so high. Now we're dealing with you know we had this high price, so now everybody wants more for their chemicals and their fertilizer and their equipment and all this, and then then the rice price falls and nobody wants to bring their costs back down. You know, so now we're freaking up here and the price is down here and it's just not good. Giving back all your profits for two years. So what's the crop that's doing the best now? So somebody said tomatoes a while ago was it was a bunch it's of not money. now tomatoes oh, yeah. and rice kind of went together. Uh, tomatoes are down, but it's it's almonds are coming back. There is no real good crop in California right now. Interesting. No, but almonds, walnuts, and prunes are, are almonds, all, almonds, walnuts, prunes, and pistachios are all going back. So that's huh. what's good. Interesting. Well, we got two special guests today. We have Rock Merlot and Riley Haw with Merlot Waterfowl Company. Um, Rocky, kind of tell us a story. You've been involved with everything. You're a farmer, been on the CWA's board, volunteer for a long time, been involved in the waterfowl industry. Why don't you kind of tell us about the story of how Merlot Waterfowl began? Well, it uh, it started back in the f- mid-50s with uh, Pete Merlot. And Pete had ranches down there, um, down in by Gridley. Um, one of the ones that most of your viewership would know is the Bering Ranch. You know, okay. So we started there. Uh, Pete had the Bering Ranch. He leased it. And he had uh, kids down there hunting and helping him back in the day, kind of like what we do now. Um, and my dad and his brother and his cousins, Roger and Ralph, and Gerald Serco and Harry Boyle, they were all down there helping. They were 15, <laughs> some, 16, some names, 17. Yeah. Uh, they were out of Chico, you know, a lot of those guys. And uh, the Circos were there out of Yuba City and... But those 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 crews all kind of ran together and they hunted and that was a big area right there around the buttes, um, and so uh, Pete had a pheasant club, dry fields for they had the goose pits and then they had some duck stuff, um, 
And then they just kind of slowly, um, he grew after that and kind of spread out and worked his way back up to by Chico um, in the early 60s and um, got there on August Frias. And we got the Quant Ranch. Pete had the Quant. And then he had um, the Fen Ranch. Um, and so all in all, Pete was running about 10,000, 11,000 acres of Duck Club back then and Pheasant Club. Mostly rice ground, or was like the bearing, was it wetland there was back a, then? There was all? probably, I couldn't tell you, yeah. but I assume there was, you know, grain. There was, I get, I know there was like sugar beet fields and corn fields and okay. stuff like that back then. And there was a lot of row crops planted yeah. with the rice inter- intermittent. Um, and then you know, obviously you had all your riparian lands that weren't developed yet or slough areas and stuff. Um, and then, you know, the mid-60s came and um, my dad <clears throat> got out of, got out of the army and uh, was in the reserves. And so he was bouncing around around the mid sixties. Um, and he started working with Pete and guiding. Um, and then dad had a couple of his buddies that were um, guiding with him. Um, and then ended up getting, dad ended up getting brought over to Lano Seco by a guy named Jim Altenberg in, um, the late 60s. Uh, and so dad was, uh, at that time, was bouncing around the M&T Ranch, uh, Lano Seco, and helping Pete on his stuff. And then the the Mallard Ponds got going in the early 70s where they were guiding every day. And so dad then just stayed on Lano Seco full time with Altenburg. And then my cousin Ralph would come over and uh, Ralph would call with them and to another guy, Jim Tupin, a higher patrolman. And and it was basically the three of them. And uh, they were doing a lot of calling. And every now and then somebody else would come in and help. But that pretty much ran through the 70s that way. And uh, <clears throat> then we come to the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, Jim Altenberg passed away. And then um, Merle Lighty came in and partnered with Dad. Uh, and then those two guys had a fallen out in the around 82. Um, I was at that time, I was in uh, freshman in high school. I was hunting on what it was called the Adams Ranch then. And uh, me and my buddies were all hunting there just south of Durham off of Butte Creek. <clears throat> we were roaming around that place hunting wherever we wanted. Uh, the owners of it let us have access. Um, in uh Dad was seeing what we were bringing home at night, you know, when he got home, he'd see what was hanging. And it's five five minutes from his doorstep. He didn't have to go through floodwaters and deal with, Dips. you know, deal with yeah. individuals, personalities that were his partners. And so uh, he decided to go down and talk to Sam Nevis, who owned the ranch at the time. And uh, he talked to Sam and said, I want to relocate my guide service and start a duck club here and a pheasant club. And Sam and him worked out a deal and uh, around 82. And so me and my buddies lost our premium hunting ranch. <laughs> he, he cut <laughs> to your dad. And, uh, he cut you off <laughs> to the we, playground. We man. went from, you know, being kings of the hill to the slave labor. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so it was all great. But so in 82, he started what was called Butte Creek Gun Club on the Adams Ranch. And Butte Creek Gun Club... Um, really kind of blew up pretty quick. It was a pretty badass place. Um, he had 7,000 acres there all together. We had all kinds of sloughs that ran through the property. There were ponds on it on the north end. There was um, ponds out in the foothills right off the edge of it. And we just, as kids, we just, I mean, we were in high school then. It just was amazing. I mean, you had pheasants everywhere, wild pheasants all over the ranch and there was multiple crops grown on it, safflowers, so we had the dove hunting. Yes. And there were grain crops grown. We had wheat fields out there, a lot of rice. Um, it was great. There was a lot of mallards, a lot of sprig, you know, seven duck limit. Then we went, you know, obviously a few years we were down at a four duck limit. But, um, yeah, we ran there for 10 years, had the big clubhouse. My mom did a lot of the cooking. Uh, Dad was running a lot of corporate hunts through there. Um, we built the business up. Uh, he made a living with the farming and the duck hunting, and 
so he made a pretty good living for his family, put me through school. And, uh, you know, that ran until 92, 1992. And in 1990, when that, uh, the financial crisis hit with the savings and loan, uh, that ranch got taken back by the bank. Um, and so a savings and loan had that ranch and um, there were just kind of tenant farmers floated through for two years. And then uh, in 92, a gentleman shows up to buy the ranch and uh, the ranch was valued then at around, they were trying to get nine million for it, eight and a half million. Um, and this guy came in, had a lot of money and he made a offer to the savings loan for about seven million or six point nine, and they took it, and <clears throat> that was last year at Butte Creek Gun Club, and uh, then that's when we met Ken Hoffman, and Ken bought the ranch and changed their name to Rancho Esquan. Uh, my dad stayed there, and Ken didn't want my dad to leave, and so uh, that's when I decided I. Didn't want to work there with them. I wanted to kind of do my own thing. So I took all of our decoys and uh, one little three-wheeler <laughs> and <laughs> went and got a loan at Tri-County's Bank for 20000 bucks and bought more decoys and bought a, another four-wheeler and bought a truck. And we started Merlot Waterfowl Service and started. I started renting ranches around Rancho Esquan because I knew I didn't want to get too far from there, kind of keep it in the same area, so... Kind of took over 99, and I kind of moved over to Agus Frias and locked that up. And and that's when we started, and here we are today. Nice. That's uh, I didn't know that about uh, Ranch Resquan and the beginnings of that. That's yeah. pretty cool. Now, you've guided forever. It's been in your family. I mean, what are some of the biggest challenges and differences that you see from back then to present-day waterfowl hunters and what you're dealing with? on a, a yearly basis the the games probably change. I know you guys do a lot of goose hunting now. Um, what are some of the biggest differences you've seen? Lead. Lead? <laughs> <laughs> no more wood calls. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of changes. Um, you know, you got your, uh, some of the biggest is just, uh, you know, the electronics that are used today. Um, there's just a lot of the skill, you know, some of that, finesse and skill that we used to have is really not needed much anymore. Um, you know, a lot of electronic devices are now in the field to, you know, kind of take that edge that we had off, um, you know, with, you know, our, you know, having our strings out and the decoy spread and movement and so forth. And, mm -hmm. you know, our style of calling was always evolving. Um, we, you know, we were pretty aggressive in our, you know, with the evolution of what we have today, you know, from where we were to where we are today. Uh, you know, so the, the 80s and 90s were, you know, exciting times. There was a lot of new technology kind of being built. We were working on things in the field, and um, we always wanted to be, you know, the top, you know, the best guide service in the Valley. And uh, that came with a lot of thought and a lot of work and a lot of failure. Um and we perfected some different aspects of waterfowling that a lot of folks use today. And um, it was just a fun time. Um, but we were blessed that we had a lot of ground to be able to move around on. And I've worked with some really good people in my company. Um, I've met a lot of cool dudes that guided with us and uh, helped build it. Um, you know, it was a lot of teamwork in getting where we are today. That's Riley, when did you get on? With I was thinking that on the drive here. I was like, man, I wonder when I did start because time has flown, but I think it's 2016. So oh, wow. You've been, been eight for years. A while. Uh, oh, wow. I was doing the, I started guiding for Jeff Gonzalez, the previous uh, manager, and now here I am still trucking along. You were a young buck when you worked for us. So yeah. that was or actually, me feel it old. was either 2016 or 18 I started yeah. with Rocky. Yeah. It was what it was. Either of those two years, so it's nice. been six or eight years. What have you seen since you started? Is it is it duck hunting harder? Has uh, the goose hunting changed? I don't have my personal opinions on it, but uh, I wouldn't say things have really changed um, as far as like hunting them goes. But learning how to hunt them and learning how to manage what we're 
what we're dealt with, that's changed. Um, we're getting better and better every year, learning how to hunt with what we got. You know, yeah. you, you can't over pressure them or under hunt them. Um, so it's kind of, you know, just we're finding that, that happy medium. Yeah. I think where you guys have, a, I would say, an upper hand on some is you guys are able to manage large tracts of ground and you're able to yeah. kind of manage the hunting pressure where, you know, some other folks, they might just have a blind to hunt geese yeah, in, exactly. et cetera. And you're really just kind of tossing your the coin up in there, hoping that the geese are in your areas. But you guys actively go out, manage pressure, et cetera. Yeah. So your clients have nice, you know, successful hunts. That's what you guys want at the end of the day, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's a team effort. Like Rocky's, he's the one who makes the calls every morning and evening and scouting. And he's usually dead on every time. And sometimes we why are you set there? You know, no, I <laughs> said that. Yeah. And usually, you know, 99% of the time he's correct. And we just, we roll with it. And he knows, you know, seeing it, like he said, he's been there since 1980s. He knows the ball game at this point. So yeah, it's, it's fun to work together. And you guys are still doing day duck hunts as well. Yeah. What do you guys think is your bread and butter? It seems like goose hunting world. I mean, you guys put in some incredible numbers and, some credible footage out there um, to the foul life, et cetera. I mean, that's been pretty neat to kind of watch you guys grow there. Well, it's like Riley was saying, we he made a he made a statement there that a lot of folks don't, you know, wouldn't understand, you know, when he mentioned under hunting them. You know, I had a, there was a rule that we had probably about eight years ago where we'd let a field set for five days and let it build up. And that wasn't the right thing to do that we learned um, cause we'd feed them out too quick. Mm -hmm. And so then we would have a real small window on the take and the fields, you know, we learned that, you know, we watch them hit and, um, and we would slip in on them on day two or three and not let it sit five or six. Um, you know, trying to get 200, that's great. Hard to do it. Um, but you know, 105 or 110 or even 87, those are, I think those are workable, you know, numbers for the, for the parties that we were guiding. And, um, it's more realistic numbers for these guys to obtain because the hunt lasts about an hour and a half too. Um, you know, that's kind of the goose side, the duck side's different. Um, you know, it's pretty much still weather dependent out in rice, you know, you really got to have the weather. Uh, or a major drought mm -hmm. that we learned a couple of years ago. Droughts, yeah. droughts help. That helps. <laughs> droughts, as if you, you know, have the water. If you have water. <laughs> if you have the water. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we did a good job with the water, and um, we were real fortunate and blessed that year as well to be fully flooded. But, um, but it's you know, it's like Riley was saying, it's just a lot of planning. Um, you know, these guys are Riley, Zane, and Bailey, and Alex, they're, um, they're starting their mornings at, 2 30 3 a.m um when i'm you know still in bed and uh i get up about 4 35 and i'll roll out there and there are days that i'll hunt with them and there's days that i'll just go and kind of cruise around and um watch the fields and watch the bird patterns and then once we get the pattern down and we kind of see what they're doing um you can kind of start putting it together um again the ducks they're Kind of what I've noticed over the years, the ducks will just have their general areas that they kind of move into, and then mm -hmm. they move around with all the flooding. Um, Lawn Waseco is doing a better job on their waterfowl, on their water management and their ground management. So Lawn Waseco is holding more birds now. And so that's helping us out up there. Um, before, when they were doing minimal um, sticker fields, the birds would kind of just stage there and move on. Um, but they're holding more up north. So that definitely helps us out. Um, but in Tule Lake and Klamath, not having water on it was really, really hurt us. That's yeah. done, that's been a <clears> – we need them as the bank for the duck hunting, you know. And what folks don't really understand is um, that, re that refuge up there system is a bank. And every time there's a storm – us on the north end of the valley in the rice fields, the flooded rice fields, we would take draws. The birds would be released out of there. They would come down, and we would get a new little influx. Yep. Instead of when there's no water up there, they all come at one time. Mm -hmm. They stage here, yeah. and we are yeah. the bank, and then they move on when the storms come, right. and then we lose them all. Okay, so um, it's nice now that we'll have it flooded this year. We're going to see the benefits of that. 
um, those birds will go will be traveling back and forth. And when you're on the north end of the valley, you really benefit from that. Yeah, I don't and think so the duck hunting will benefit. I think a lot of people realize if they've never been up there how big the Klamath Basin is and how important it is. You know, and, and on those drought years, like you said, we see it down here because we were seeing those big influxes of of widgeon, pintail, etc. Super early, way earlier than we have in years past, when normally you get a storm and here they come, they bounce back and forth, etc. But um, yeah, need Klamath to get back to where it's at, and we're doing our part to kind of help help that. But uh, Riley, did you think guiding would be so hard when you you know before you got into it? I think everyone thinks like, oh, I want to be a guide. I want to be a guide when I grow up, but it's yeah. long, hard, tough work. Yeah. No, it is. Uh, it's not for everyone. I can tell you that. It's it's about being persistent and just staying at it, having a positive attitude. Every day is different. Um, yeah. You meet so many different people. Um, it hasn't become hard for me. Uh, it's it's just at this point it's a job, uh, and I yeah I enjoy mm-hmm. the hell out of it. You know, I couldn't ask for a better position. Um, So it's hard not to like it, you know. Uh, I look at myself and go, what else would I rather be doing right now? And it's pretty much nothing. (laughs) Um, It is year-round. Like, it's not just all fun and games. It's it's year-round, especially with how many blinds Rocky actually has, you know, repairing them in the springtime, in the fall. Um, It's it's never-ending. I can go on and on, but it's never been a a job, so to speak. It's just been fun. Yeah, I hear you on that. Um, someone that's never been with a guide before, what should their expectations be like booking a hunt and then actually going on the hunt itself? Like what should they think of? Like a lot of people will be like, all right, the goose limit's 30. Should I bring three, eight boxes of shells? (laughs) What's the reality of a hunter should think of before going? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, cause you do get a lot of guys that'll come in with a case of shells and think that they'll spend it. But, um, it's almost like an interview. When I talk to clients, I'm kind of getting a feel of where they're at in the game. If they're beginner, if they're medium hunter, if they're expert hunters, you can kind of tell who you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. So you kind of uh, give them what they need, um, give the information that they need, and go from there. So it's not uh, hard for me. I kind of get to. I'm really good at reading people, so I could tell what information they need and. As far as what they're looking for, uh, you know, they're looking for a lot of some guys are looking to learn. So, yeah, you know, it's not necessarily about the hunt itself. So yeah. then you go after that little aspect of the hunt. You try to teach them more than actually harvest a duck. Um, but some guys are out there to, to harvest and not learn. You know, they already know that. So yeah. then you're solely focused on trying to harvest stuff rather than teaching them as you go. You kind of have to match that personality with. Yeah. the personality of your guide and your staff too, right? So to make sure that they kind of blend in together. Yeah. Um, I think we're seeing more and more goose hunters or want to be goose hunters in the Valley now. It seems like everybody's carrying around a trailer behind their truck or multiple trailers and renting fields. What advice do you guys have for goose hunters or people that want to get into goose hunting um, in the Sacramento Valley, whether it be even, you know, public refuges get in sack and delve in later in the season, or if they're looking to lease fields. Go for it. Huh? Uh, my advice, just be able to just be mobile, man. Um, you can't really, I mean, if you're, if your bank is, yeah, I can lease one field and that's my goose field for the year. Um, you got to, learn how to hunt it real quick, right? So like we said, you can't underhunt it or you can't overhunt it. Uh, it's something that you have to learn and do year after year to actually get good at it. It's nothing that you can just come in and just be the best right off the bat. It's For me, it's just staying persistent. And, you know, I've been doing this since I was in a crib, so to speak, learning how to shoot specs on the west side by myself when I was 12, 13 years old. So you, you do it year after year after year. Uh, you'll get better at it. It's nothing that you can just go in and, and be really good. It's, it's about failing. I've failed so, so, so many times, um, and I've succeeded a lot of times, but you're never going to be perfect. Um, advice is just be mobile, man. Uh, decoy spread, that's all everyone's, you know, that's different. Everyone will, will argue with you what, what to run. We only run full bodies, but for a guy like 
um, someone that's going out to a refuge sack and delve. And obviously you got to be mobile and not pack out all these full bodies to the free room. So then that's when you start looking at socks and that game. Like if you're a guy with a pit blind, that that's your that's your spot. Semi sim, smaller spread, let's call it a hundred deeks. Yeah, leaving goose decoys out all year. No. Opinion on that? Yeah. No, <laughs> no. <Yeah>. never. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, that that's my opinion. I mean, if you have one place to hunt, let them get in there, scout it, and then go hunt them. Um, and if you don't have the ability to scout, you know, you're kind of hoping that it it works out. But yeah, my opinion with the goose hunting. Everything's got to be pretty up to par. And if your stuff's out there all year, faded, et cetera, pr- not giving yourself the best chance to succeed because those geese have seen that spread. They might have already worked the spread <laughs> earlier in the week and you right. weren't there. So you really don't know, right? Yeah. I think that's a challenge for a lot of the guys that do like rent a single field now. It's like, you know, they're not up there scouting. So the geese may be in their field and they go up there a week and a half later. Oh, there's feathers everywhere. <laughs> yeah. They're going to be here. And it's like, no, they're yeah. gone. Like, yeah. sorry, you yeah. missed your shot. Yep. Yeah, and you see that driving around the valley, right? You know which fields have blinds in it, et cetera. And yeah, you're right. There might be a weekend where think they, think about the the guy that up. has the field at the north end of of where our ice blind is, and how many days we drove by, and his field was loaded, and he had that a frame in it. And oh, no, yeah. nobody ever hunted it, and I'm like, that guy's missing out. It was like a two week section where he could have pounded. They it. were there, like next to the blind. And no, too. nobody and ever hunted it, and all he had was a little a frame next to the to the check, and they were right next to it. They were never in, saw yeah. him there once. No. Yeah. That's a good thing, you know, to learn too is you got to hit it right. Yeah, you can't be sleeping at home. If you do lease that one field out, you better better be watching it all the time because when they're there, they're there and they're going to be out pretty quick. They'll yeah. feed a field out really fast. Now, with you guys mentioned it earlier, you guys are hunting the fields earlier once they get in there. Are you able to get multiple hunts off that field now by getting in there early, opposed to like letting it build up, mega, you know, grind and then. <laughs> having one hoorah and then just not coming back yeah we know it's like last year you know it's just just understanding the patterns and you know just taking the years past you know because it was like last year and i knew and i pretty much called it right i said we're not going to have a good year it's going to be tough um you know the rains come it's going to be short-lived and it's going to be over um and that's kind of how it happened there was no there was no goose hunting in October, November, very minimal. A little bit on some flood up fields, but for the most part, there was so much water. Mm-hmm. Everything was really spread out, mm-hmm. and so we didn't have any concentrations. So we just kind of kept doing our work, got our duck blinds ready. But then I knew that once everything was flooded, everything stabilizes out, these birds are going to kind of get into their areas, and then they're going to they're going to be there, and and they're going to be close, and they're going to be kind of starting to concentrate where there's no hunting area, you know, where people aren't hunting, they're going to start finding their safe spots. <clears throat> but then when them rains hit in December, they're oh, going to God, come to yeah. our big fields because we had that one ranch, that 3,000-acre ranch that's dry. And so we just, I watched the cranes, you know, the sand hills get in there. And the first rain day mm-hmm. that we had in December, we, I sent these guys in, and I go, okay, we're hunting tomorrow. Oh, there's nothing there, and da 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 da. And I said, "It's they're going to come," and they did. <laughs> we set up. It was raining, low clouds. You know, it was December 18th or 15th, whatever it was. You know, just go set where most of the cranes were. You know, and uh, and them specks came. You yeah. know, and and but the very next day when the sun came out, zero. Wow. They went right back to the water. You know, they went right back to flooded fields, and so we played that game all the way up until around the first couple of days in January, you know, so we played the rain days and then the sunny days we went back to the water. Okay. But the boys are doing just fine on the water. I mean, they're killing between 20 and 45, 50 specks on the water as well That's on great. certain days, you know, so they're doing good on the, on the flooded fields too. Um, you know, not as good as a dry field hunt. It's not the same experience, but it's still good shooting. Um, but then January came and, and then we had a good, you know, 12, 15 days of good, dry field hunting. Um, the birds were patterned over. They kind of crossed over to the dry. They left the water. But then it just got too much rain. And uh, from the 20th on, 19th or 20th on, I think we look at our pictures, it was just over, you know. Mm-hmm. And then it was like maybe 20 birds you would get. We were shooting the same. They were shooting the same recycled birds in the dry. Mm. There was no new birds. Um, it was all the same birds. And they had it figured out. So they just avoided us. 
And we try. Yeah. <laughs> but that's all you can do. <laughs> they just they were they avoided us and you just keep hoping that new birds move in. But again, there was nothing up north to come down. Yeah. And there was no reverse migration. And then for them to turn back around because we didn't have any big north winds. So um we were kind of dead in the water at that point and the season was over and we were way different than the year before. We were much lower on our numbers and uh, but still good numbers from historically. You know what's what's good numbers for you guys? Well, well, there's the drought numbers, and then there was <laughs> historical when we would have decent seasons. You know, so I mean, our our you know before the drought, you know, a good we would shoot for fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred specs. Okay, okay, that's just kind of what we were shooting for. And then the drought came, and it kind of changed all that. And yeah. it was like we were really focusing more on the on the deep geese than we were the ducks. Mm-hmm. Um, more of our clientele wanted to do that. It was, you know, obviously shoot 10 specs is better than five or six, seven ducks um, to some good people. Uh, so we were doing a lot of focusing on the geese and um, having really good goose hunts. And we'd also have good duck hunts, um, but um, we did really, we had, we, we racked up some pretty good hunts for people, with, with, but we would start in November. Yeah, mm. that was the difference. You know, we were starting to shoot geese on dry around the tenth of November, mm-hmm. and we would shoot them all through November, all through December, and into January. Wow. Yeah. You know, it was so it was just constant. And uh, but now we do things a little differently. We're running two spreads. We'll break up, and we'll we, you know we'll we'll we're gonna hunt on two different areas on August freest, and we'll keep the birds moving every three days, two three days. Okay. We're not letting them um, just sit for five. So. Running two groups a day for geese has helped, um, you know, anywhere from five to seven clients. And then um, then we need to do that, too. The expense is high on what we do. So yeah. we've got a big expense. And what, what's your guys' decoy spread like number-wise? And then is there a ratio of snows and spec decoys that you guys like to hit? Uh we have too many decoys, too many full bodies, right? <laughs> uh, we don't ever throw everything. Uh, we always have leftovers, but a typical morning hunt would be right around 750 to 1,000 whites, full bodies. Mm-hmm. And then we'll throw about 150, 160 spec full bodies. But okay. some, some days we'll only throw 24 spec full bodies. It all depends. Gotcha. Uh, if, if the feed's predominantly whites and you know you're going to be going after the white bird that day, then you change your spread around a little bit don't really target the specs and, and vice versa. Gotcha. So if it's a speck belly hunt, then that's when we'll we'll start to throw the 160 and the 180 and really try to square them up for everybody. Nice. And, and what's the etiquette on a client and they bring their duck calls or goose calls <laughs> to the pit? I mean, some people are like, yeah, have at it. And then other people are like, that's not happening. What's yeah. What's normal? What should someone... For do me. as a as a client to respect the guide yeah uh in a duck point i say have at it it depends on the the person too especially youngsters like have at it it doesn't affect me at all yeah as long as i mean you know when you connect with the duck with your call right and when you do you can bring it right in um so it someone in the background really not trying to connect with the duck isn't going to mess with that duck coming in if you actually yeah communicate with it um on a goose hunt when you get all the racket going, I like to think they hear us, but <laughs> I when thought they're that right too. There, <laughs> just deafening. Yeah, when they're deafening. Um, yeah, you're like, come on. Uh, they they might be able to hear you, but there's some instances where we have on film, like the bottom of a spin uh, getting shot out, and then the top of the spin still continuing to right. come down, and you shoot at it twice. So that's when I'm like, those birds at the top didn't really hear a shoot at the bottom. How do they yeah. expect to hear you calling? Right. So that answers your question, too. I mean, if there's lots of birds, lots of racket, I don't think it matters. But on certain days where calling does matter and you don't want to touch your call within the last 30, 40 yards, just don't even say anything and let your decoys and your hide do your work, that's when it would matter. I was like, dude, don't even say anything <laughs> right now. Like, you're going to give ourselves away. Yeah. So it matters. Well, especially the goose hunting, that is a lesson learned, right? You, you're you out there a lot, and you know when to call and when not to call, yeah. where you might have a, a new hunter or someone that's that's new into hunting geese, and they're 
doing a note like when they're wanting to touch down you're like dude yeah. just yeah. lay off the call you yeah. sound great but just right. lay off yeah. the call but that's all lessons learned you yeah. know being out in the blind a lot yeah uh, rock do you have any early predictions for the how this season's gonna go based off of ag and what we're seeing so far yeah we're gonna have a mirror of last year if the weather is the same pattern um, I hope but, the weather's not the same. <laughs> yeah, great, do, great dome for half the year. <laughs> More than likely, I think it will be. But, um, you know, the forecast is a little cooler than normal, so that will be a benefit for us. But what we're really going to benefit from is having all that water on Klamath and Thule. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, a lot of folks have forgotten really how important that that is up there to hold those birds and to trickle them into the valley instead of having them all just come at one time. Um, that'll be a benefit. And two, we've, you know, we've raised, you know, a lot more gadwall and mallard and teal up there. So that'll be a, a, a benefit that we'll get. Um, I don't think our botulism was as bad as what it could have been. So that's a, we have a lot of those birds up there that are going to make it down here for the, for the October, November. And so those first rains, in December, um, you know, we're going to get back to that pattern where, you know, that one o'clock in the afternoon rainstorm is epic. Yeah. You know, that's really kind of cool when you're watching those migrations come in. Yep. Um, we haven't seen those in a number of years, you know, probably about eight or 10. Uh, and so we'll see them again this year. And so I'm looking forward to that. Good. You know, um, you know, we have those ranches on the leading edge of the orchards up on the north end of the valley. And so that's really where you get to kind of experience that migration, you know, when you see him coming in over the trees. That's awesome. Cool. We were talking earlier when we first got here about birds in the fields they select, whether it's standing stubble or dist or burned or what do you, what's the preference that you guys see for geese nowadays? You know, is it like a burn field that still has some standing? Is that preferred over just a field? Like what, what do they go to? Does it matter? What do, like? what do you like? What do you like? Wherever there's rice, yeah, that's where they want to go. We will hide in anything. I mean, mm -hmm. we're we're we have we're set up to hide multiple different ways, but um, but yeah, I mean, a burnt field is fine. The speckled bellies prefer the burnt, um, but we still have to, you know, the hide is a little bit more challenging. Yeah, but we're set up for that. Um, the but the tall stubble fields, you know, you can. A lot of times you can do, you know, better in there, especially if you have a dome, um, just because we can hide, you know, in the stubble. We, can, you know, we can be broken up more. Um, but we're hunting in chopped and chiseled with no water. It hasn't been flooded yet in rainwater. Um, we're hunting burnt fields. We're hunting standing stubble fields. And we're hunting fields that are just been mowed twice, oh, okay, that are perfectly flat. And so... Those are pretty much the four fields we hunt through the season. And then obviously, you know, late season or the special goose will go to the green fields. We can yeah. go to grass fields and stuff like that. You know, so then we really will be out in the foothills. We'll go hunt the pastures. Mm -hmm. So we hunt wherever they are. Do you see a timing in terms of when they get in the fields between like a, a field that's been mowed twice to a field that has not and you have the standing stubble like during the time of the year? Is it more like? Oh, they'll get in the mode stuff early. The later stuff is the stubble late in the season just because it hasn't been fed out yet. I mean, what do you guys see out, out there? They hit, they hit where the cranes are. Okay. So where the cranes are feeding, they fall they're gone. The cranes are That's where they'll go. <laughs> That's because wild. It'll be the, the birds, you know, in our side of the valley, you know, what we see is is that those spe it'll be the specks that'll hit the stubble first, not the snows. Okay, snows are secondary to that. So the cranes come in, cranes do their thing, November, December, a rainstorm hits, the speckle bellies go, will not go at that early stage. They do not go by themselves. They go to where the cranes are. Hmm. And so you'll get a couple a couple flocks will land there one day, and then a few more, and then the build up, and then you'll get a couple hundred specks in there, 300, 400 specks, and then a, the snows will come. Wow, and man. it's like whatever, however they tell each other, I have no idea what email they got, but it is funny because this is like a light switch. They come, um, but you're not going to watch the snows on a normal year. Those 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 snow geese will not hit that dry until right there after Christmas around New Year. Oh, that's when they that's when they come in. Um, 
and you know they're they're just on the refuges in the water up until then yeah you know um just kind of how they are but the speckle bellies would be the first ones but again they go to the cranes they feel safe with them so that's why they go to them interesting hmm. have you seen any differences hunting the west side riley compared to where you guys are at now yeah pressure i mean sure yeah, yeah pressure's number one it's it's hard to beat what what we got right on what rocky has you can't really compete with it yeah yeah well you also mentioned the size of the ranches the west side doesn't have the those well, yeah. those those parcel size that we have in the area we're in mm-hmm. you know so there's a lot of thousand two thousand acre ranches over where we are over on the west side it's 100 to 250 acres 40 acres 80 acres right. and there's a lot of small little ran, you know farms and stuff like that broken mm-hmm. up over the years well, that's what you different. see nowadays. They all get subleased out, so you drive by, and it's like goose bread, goose bread, goose bread, goose bread, goose bread. And it's like, really? Yeah. <laughs> or the guy, like, jump shooting grinds on the west side. Like, it <laughs> yeah. seems like that's more prevalent. Yeah. And you got there. the closure, too, so. But it's yeah. great. You know, you know, guys, it's great that all these guys are doing that. You know, I, I like to see all those guys out there trying, you know, and it it gives me hope, you know, because um, out, of, out of all those guys, you're getting a handful of them that are really good, yeah. that are learning a lot. Yeah. Um, you see that, you know, the new names and faces at these goose calling contests, like when they just yeah. had it, you know, in Calusa. And some of these individuals that are, you know, really gung ho, um, you know, we had that one boy Gar, yeah. you know, up there in our area that loves it. He's passionate about it. He's 20 years old, you know, and, yeah. um, you know, just goes and just goes for it, you know, wherever he can go with his little trailer and his spread and, you know, he'll, you know, he'll do it one day and he'll, he's going to be a good guide. Yep. But, um, you know, you just hope that they're learning, you know, they're not doing the same thing and you know, they just keep the ethics side of it, you know, first and foremost. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Now, this one's going to get a little bit more in the future. Where, where do you think the future of waterfowl hunting and the California hunter is going? I mean, you've been involved in a long time. You've been in, involved with CWA and mul- multiple different facets. Where do you see that going? Well, I mean, I think that we've, you know, we have a pretty good plan to, um, you know, expand our membership base and therefore expand hunters. Um, you know, working the schools the way we've been doing and now our program with getting memberships, you know, to kids at different camps and Different events and venues um, is a plus um, to bring more, you know, we always say to bring the, you know, more young hunters in. Um, our, the ranches that we have now, um, you know, we're giving, you know, a, a, a better experience for a, a lot more people that would never have that in the past, that private ranch setting. And so I think that once you get the taste of that, that kind of hooks you. Um, and we're hoping that that grows the, um, the not only our membership base here at Cal Waterfowl, but also the membership base out in the field, um, you know, in the general hunting. Uh, you know, we have 54,000 waterfowlers in California, plus or minus, given a year. That's kind of holding. Um, we had a little bump up during COVID, you know, a 3% increase. Um, so we just want to make sure that we keep that number stable as best as we can. And I think that between the organizations, the conservation organizations, I think they're trying hard, um, you know, working real hard at that. Um, and we're sustaining ourselves. Yeah. Um, my concern is, is that we, um, I mean, I hope there's some individuals that step up like I did. You know, I get concerned about that. I'm not tooting a horn, but I'm just saying we need, we need some in the private sector to kind of step up and, you know, put, the resource and these organizations first um, and really go for it. Um, I haven't seen that individual. I hope one of these guys do it Um, because, you know, I'm 57 now. I've been doing it for a while. (laughs) Um, But, you know, I'm going to do it until I can't do it anymore. But, God, we just need some of those young guys or young gals to come up and really want to, you know, not only be on boards, not only run dinners, but also, you know, bring new hunters into the fold, guide them, take them, you know, not worry about hunting with their friends, you know, that are, you know, their same age, but taking a half a dozen kids out that are a pain in the ass. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's the fun. 
That's what we need to do. Yeah. And that's where I love doing that. You know, I would rather hunt with kids today or beginning hunters than, you know, anyone that's a veteran. You know, these guys know it all. My own private ponds and stuff like that. <clears throat> I try to take someone that's never experienced that. And like I said, once you give them that experience and they get the taste of a seven duck hunt, you know, where they're in their face, feet down, all that, you got them. Yeah. They're going to try to do that on their own. They want to blow their own call. They want to go get their own camo. They want to do their own thing. And we do have a big refuge system in California, you know, so they have places to go, mm-hmm. you know. So I see, I, 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 I'm, I'm optimistic for the future just because I know what internally, what we're planning, you know, we're doing here at CWA. Um, then I know the staff, you know, our, you know, our, our, you know, we got a new change there with Jake as, as, as president. CEO, um, and um, you know he's got a lot of good ideas, and I think that um, I think we're going to see some. St- e- e- we'll be stable, but I'm hoping that you know bringing the new hunters in, we we grow the base. Yeah, I'm optimistic too. I mean, it's hard for us because we're meeting new folks, just like you guys are constantly. So when people talk about doom and gloom i'm like well i got a hundred stories of someone that <laughs> yeah. just, i got a wait list of people wanting to sign up for or events. like you know went to the refuge for the first time and had a positive experience and now they are a member or a volunteer or whatever but um you're right it takes all everyone as a group to get involved and a lot of people might be on the fence you just got to do it because you, you it. know the future depends on everyone getting involved because if you're not involved at all and all you are is just taking the resource, there's not going to be any resource to, to take. You know? That's what I was yeah. saying. There needs to be – you got to get those hard chargers, those, those individuals that come with a lot of ideas, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I've – you know, as you know, Jeff, I got a lot of ideas and, you know, we are always talking about them and I'm, I'm constantly thinking on ways to improve or to, you know, help the resource, you know, grow – not only our base, but also the the waterfowl themselves. You know, you can just r- go back seven years, six years ago. Um, you know, we and I'll say this till I go to the grave. There was a meeting where Cal Waterfowl, where we had it here in the boardroom, and I brought up buying water for a refuge to help it, Little Dry Creek, and it was a World War Three in the boardroom because we're not in the business to buy water for a state or federal refuge. That's not what we're here for. Mm-hmm. And I had a different aspect of that. I had a different idea. I go, that's exactly what we're here for. Yeah. If they can't do it, we need to be the ones to show them how to do it. Um, because government sometimes gets ahead of themselves and then that hurts the base. That hurts the resource. Mm-hmm. That, you know, when a refuge didn't have water, that takes the hunter out of there. They don't have that place to go. That's where our responsibility is, is make sure that they have every opportunity they can. And that meeting ended. We did not go by the water. But look what we just did at Tule Lake and Klamath. <laughs> <Yeah>. We evolved, <laughs> and we bought 4,000 acre right. feet of water. Yeah, We got it the last year, and we did it the year before, and so now we're doing it. And now we got all this water on Klamath and um, in Tule Lake, and we're going to have hunting areas opened up this year that haven't been opened up. Yeah. In a number of years. So there's more opportunity, and that's what we did. And that is what I'm proud of. And that's why I think that I have optimism for the future because we have evolved and we do understand about we need to keep these individuals in the field. Yeah. We can't let them give up and not buy a hunting license. They got to go buy the stamp. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think now with the three sp- sprig limit coming in next year. I would hope a lot of those guys that were starting to kind of get out of the rice game or like, you know, all I shoot is a pintail that hopefully that retention there is ways to get them back out in the field and be excited about. Cause we talk about it is like you go out and shoot three bull sprig in the afternoon or in the morning. That's a great day. Yeah. You know, um, cause a lot of people get frustrated shooting the one. So, um, one of many things CWA has done and, and you've been very involved with that. So, um, I'm super excited about it, but hopefully that retention really helps with with the people that have probably stepped back from it because they have hunted for 30 years and saw the heyday of, you know, pintail and mallard and shooting rice blinds. Um, but the game has changed, right? It's a little bit, a little bit different. Seven duck limit, 
Seven mallard, three sprig, ten specks, twenty snows, thirty geese. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard <laughs> not to <laughs> like. It, it, right? yeah. uh, it's like if you're a waterfowl, why the wouldn't you want to be here? Yeah, you know, I agree. This is where you want to be, and that's why we're getting the message out. Okay, um, you know it was interesting. You know, and I and I'll always <laughs> never can forget the individual when we were back at the. National Waterfowl Conference, you know, he says, what does California want next? Now you want three spring. <laughs> and I'll, and I'll, I'll laugh to that day. Mark Henley was there with me, and I sat there, and I go, yeah, exactly what we want. Uh, and we got it. Yeah. Uh, and they didn't think we were going to get it. And, you know, it's just – it's this organization that I'm, we're sitting here in their office and we're part of, you know, it really is for the, the hunters it's to put more – waders in the marsh and and we're doing that and we're sustaining it or we're improving it um and we do have a lot that are you know retiring out of it because of their age and so forth but we are bringing a lot of young folks in and a lot of females in and it's um like i said it's an exciting time yeah i'm excited with jake i i I just you know john was great we made a lot of improvements from the past and you know, if it wasn't for John, I wouldn't have came back on in, into the organization and um, been, um, you know, it was been a great run with John. We've improved a lot. But now with Jake there, you know, you know, he worked under John for all those years and Jake's been with the organization for 30 years and it's going to be, um, there's a lot of changes coming. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. No, a we're, lot of, we're going to have more advancements. Yeah. Now we're excited. So. Out of all the people that you've guided, who are some of the coolest people that you've been had the pleasure of guiding or been on a hunt with? Well, it'd have to be Ricky Henderson. Ricky that, Henderson. that was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, that was an exciting day for many reasons. A uh, couple we won't discuss, but it was very exciting day because he, he had never done it. And his first um, hunt? It was his first okay. time with me, yeah. And uh I had uh, the CEO for Safari Club, Laird Hamblin, on that hunt. Um, we had Chad Belding who was on that hunt. So it was a pretty good crew. Um, it was an amazing hunt, and it was couldn't have it any better. Uh, but he was just – he was so excited because he, he didn't know what to expect, mm-hmm. okay? And he was – Blake had – Famie had taken him out to the Martinez Gun Club, and they shot some clays and stuff like that. So he was – Somewhat familiar with the shotgun, but never had he been in a white suit laying on his back, you <laughs> yeah. know, <laughs> watching, you know, 4,000 geese come <laughs> land on him. Um, and we put him on that, you know, that we had him on a, an amazing X, and uh, it was a great hunt. He was extremely happy, extremely humbled, extremely grateful, genuine, true Ricky out there, you know, talking <laughs> about himself and Ricky loved doing this. <laughs> the first was just, person. It was, it was just amazing. Ricky liked the goose hunt. Yeah. And it was so much fun. Um, that was a good one. Um, you know, and, you know, we've we've got to hunt with a lot of celebrities and they're all fun. You know, they're all, you know, when they come and hunt with us, they get a new experience. Um, you know, the staff, you know, our guides are great. You know, they, they handle everything really well. Um, they take that. They, they manage that, you know, those individuals that are with us, those VAPs really well. You know, they don't, you know, they just treat them like they're normal people. Yeah. Everything rolls real mm-hmm. smooth. Um, they treat them just like they were. we treated the folks the day before, you know. So, you know, and they like that. Um, but the experience is still, you know, top, you know, it's a really good experience. And um, But I had a lot of folks come through, I'll tell you, um, Hard to name them all, but Ricky is the one that stands out. I had him on a goose hunt. I had him on a dove hunt, a duck hunt. <clears throat> um, and then the first time I met him uh, was a number of years ago at the Raider game. And I asked him at that game if he wanted to ever go hunting with us, and he just laughed. He goes, I'm not a hunter. I love to bass fish, though. you know. And so that was my then – Three years later, he's in the blind. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So yeah, yeah. That's cool. awesome. How about you, Riley? Uh, I like hunting with Brendel and McKivitz oh, yeah. on yeah. that that late goose hunt last year. Uh, yeah, they're cool guys. Yeah, that was that was cool, man. I was shoulder to shoulder with them, and it was just cool because at the time, you know, they weren't 
in the happiest state. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little depressed but, after that one. Yeah, but it was like Rocky said, it was like, you know what? Like, I just treated him like any old other person. And I think mm-hmm. that that was cool because we didn't bring up football once. Yeah. Uh, and I did for, I didn't bring it up for a reason. And that's what I, that was just a memorable hunt for me. It's like, these guys are just like regular old dudes, man. Well, they like, want to hunt just as much yeah, as we they're, do. They're, yeah. they're no different than anybody. I'm, and that's what I've come to realize when you ask about who we've hunted with celebrity wise it's nothing against them but at this point in my career in rocky's career we do it so often that it's just another day mm-hmm. and they're just and, normal yep. normal people and just like all usually anyone else schools. right yeah. yeah it's a cool really cool experience don't get me wrong but we treat everyone the same and i think that's what they like about us yeah 100 yeah. percent for sure now what's your guys's favorite memory favorite favorite hunt favorite memory out in the field I'm not sure I can talk about it. No. Yeah. Statue you know, of limitations is past yeah. rock. Yeah, <laughs> it was growing up. I, I mean, I just, there was so many. It's hard to name one. Well, you're a freshman at a I, huge I, ranch. I'm I, sure there's some stories yeah. there. <laughs> we had, you know, um, it just is my experiences. And that's why folks ask, like, you know, don't you get into it anymore? It's like, yeah, I do. I love it. I like when people get the experience. But you won't ever really see me just going out by myself or with one of my buddies, really, just to go shoot birds. I mean, I want a group and we want to entertain. <clears throat> just because growing up, there was so many amazing hunts that we were part of. And I was with my friends. And like I said, it was that transition period of the 80s and 90s where, um, you know, we were going from so many, the, the valley being so much dry with minimal water to a valley flooded with water. Um, you know, we were chasing Canada geese back in the nineties and, you know, we were chasing Canada's up there on the North end. The goose limit was three, one spec, two snows. Um, Canada's were two. And so you would go chase Canada's cause you could get two of them, you know? And <laughs> that's wild to think of now. <laughs> it, it is. And, and, and a bit a big, a big year was you start, shooting them in January, and if you could get 350, 325 by the end of duck season, that was a freaking, you were top. (laughs) I mean, you were amazing. And, you know, so we had so many good honker hunts that I remember those hunts because I'll never relive them again in our valley. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can go up north and northeastern and do it, but doing them right there north of the after bay and watching those lines come and sitting there in the blind where – you watch them leave the roost and they fly over you and you have to watch them because you might get one of them to stop and break them on their path to go wherever they're going to feed. But you would sit there and we would fall asleep in the blind because they come back at 11, 10, 30, 11 to go back to their roost water and they're full, but you're in a flooded field and we're right there just north of the after bay. And you would fall asleep, and I'd have four guys on each side of me, and I would just sit there sleeping in the blind, just like this. And it's 1030, <laughs> the sun's warm, it's sunny, and you would hear that beller. And you would kind of get up, and then I would start talking to them. And you would try to get that. You you could That was when you could break their flight pattern, is when they were going back, because they were comfortable, the valley's quiet, mm-hmm. there's not the banging going on. And you got the 747s out there in this water up against the foothills. And uh, you would break a flock of 30 or 40. You would break them down. And you would try to get them to feet down to land. And you would all come up. And you would drop these, cut these birds out. And you would just get a dozen of them. And you watch all your group, if everybody doubled and got their limit out of one flock. (laughs) That right there. Is memorable. I can remember every one that we did that on, and and just because of the excitement in the blind, you shot a bunch of honkers. You waited four and a half, five hours with nothing, and I always called it said it's like elk hunting. You're just gonna hunt and hunt and hunt, and pretty soon that one bull's coming. Yep. Okay, it's the same kind of adrenaline rush when they're those geese are working around, and your clients are so freaking happy. And that's when you build not only friendships for the rest of your life, you build them right there in that day. Um, You were validated as being a true badass in the field because you stuck it out. Mm -hmm. You got to remember, a lot of guys want to leave. They get bored. It's 10 o'clock. 
they're done. Nothing's going to happen to them. And then it brawl breaks loose at 1130 or 12 or 1115, whatever it is. And so I remember those hunts. And so there's just not one that really stands out except for when you shoot 11 banded honkers. <laughs> that stood out. And I'll remember that one. To, to, uh, you know, we did that there on Pumpkin Patch. That was good. And I was with some of my dad's oldest friends that are no longer, well, one of them still with us. Omer Long is still with us. Um, but I was, uh, yeah, there was five of us in the blind. And we called in, I called in 12. And they all landed in front of us. They were landing. And we cut them all out, all great shots. And they were all banded. That's very cool. <laughs> Every one of them. That's it so was awesome. the coolest thing because it was the and how how that was was the pair uh-huh. and, and then all, their... all the Goslings got manned and they all stood together and they came down out of Elmanor. I think it was Elmanor or Klamath, something like that. But yeah, no. So there was those, so you I could just start saying naming off these memorable hunts. But it's just like I said, I was I'm humbled, I'm blessed. My dad set it up, Uncle Pete set it up. You know, for me to have the best of the best when it comes to waterfowling. And so we just try to give it back now. I mean, and unfortunately it's, it's, you know, with inflation and costs, it comes with a price tag. You know, Mm -hmm. we try to keep it down as best as we can, but you know, to give those experiences like I had as a kid and in my teens and college to, to, to give folks those experiences, it just comes with a big price tag now, but we can still, we can still experience them. You yeah. can still experience those badass hunts that you'll never forget. And that's what we strive for every day. You know, that's what these guys have, you know, I've instilled into them to do. Um, and, you know, the boys, they they work hard. You know, they, they do. It's, I mean, I'm telling you, 3 in the morning, 2.30 up. They don't go to bed till 6 or 7 at night, 8, and they got to get back up again. Um, we have a good crew. Um you know, we got the, the the three to four guides and then the callers and then Riley's my number one show. And um, and then we got my boys are coming into it too now. Um, that's a benefit and it's exciting for me to see that. Um, but, you know, we have our setup crew. We got the, we call them the Amigos. They're great. They're, they love it. They're there. They get there early in the morning too. They never thought in their lifetime they would be doing what they're doing, setting up decoy <laughs> spreads at four in the morning with headlamps on. They exciting. They get to meet a lot of different people. You know, they're treated really well. They get, you know, camouflage and calls and all kinds of cool things. So the experience back to where we began with this, it's just the whole everything from my beginning to now is just an amazing experience. The whole thing can't it's like full circle moment it's, it's pretty it cool. is and it's like and it doesn't stop you know at my age right now um there's not many folks that have gone on i mean there's no one in the valley that's done it as long as i have um but it's you know at, at the end of the day we're not stopping we're just we just keep growing it and keep improving it um we have so we have we do do some face plants periodically mm-hmm. where but we do have them, you know, and it's unfortunate because unfortunately that group takes it personally. You know, we had a couple last year, one last year. It was unfortunate. If they're listening, sorry. <laughs> uh, and they take it personally and it's like, you know, it's like we try to make everything right um, all the time. But, you know, it's, they're going to happen. And um, But the experiences, I think, like I said, every year is is a great experience that we can do this. Yeah, that's phenomenal. I think for a, a customer, that's all you're asking is just trying to put the best opportunity available. It's hunting. Sometimes it just doesn't work okay. out. But if you're on time, everything looks right, you're doing your best, friendly guides, it's a positive experience, right? Right. Where I've been on some fishing trips, or whatever, like can't get two, wor- two words out <laughs> of the guide. You're like, <laughs> you know, Man. it's fun when a guide can talk and you're having conversation and fish or no fish you're still having a good day or you know duck hunting or whatnot but we're learning something yeah Yeah, exactly right um where can someone find you guys online they're looking to book a hunt what they do it's all over um so i merlowaterfowl.com um find us there find us on instagram merlowaterfowl sweet 
And Riley, what what is your favorite memory? Oh, like Rocky said, man. Too there's, many. There's too many. Uh, there's, I think one of my uh, favorites, probably actually going out to Rancho Esquan when I was, I don't even know if Rocky knows. I think he does. I went out there like two or three times as a really young, young, young kid through his dad, through Larry. Um, and I remember just my dad having Larry's number um, and saying, hey, Riley, like, call Larry Merlo up when you're young. When I was really young, I was in, like, second, third, fourth grade, and I would call Larry and say, hey, you know, like, tell him my name. And they didn't know me from Adam at that time. We just had mutual family friends, uh, the Washburns. And uh, I would get to go out on Esquan every junior hunt from in, like, the early uh, 2005, 2006, 2007, after – um, his dad was away from there, but those hunts there, like I shot my first band in Mallard at Esquan in the back. That's um, awesome. I have some, just those hunts, because I know how special of a ranch it is to Rocky and his family, and now just a full swing. I grew up in the foothills just outside of Esquan, so I would drive to school every day and look <laughs> See over there. See all the there. Yeah. yeah. What I is lived, that place? Yeah, I lived near Butte College. I knew what it was, and I knew it was there. And I was like, I live five minutes from the best duck club in the world. Yeah. Like, I was confident that, like, that's the spot. And yeah. just being able to go there as a youngster, and I, that's really what That's pretty cool. Fires me up, or fired me up until now. Yeah. Well, I mean, I couldn't imagine being a little kid there, but as an adult, it's the most ducks I've ever seen in one location. Like, yeah. it's just hands down. People ask, you know, what is the place? Not talking about habitat or anything, just ducks on a property. Yeah. That place is has a beat that I've ever stepped foot on or seen in a refuge. It's just a beehive. Yeah. You know, it's just unreal. It's special. It's a beautiful area, man. It, yeah. You can't really beat it. Well, I mean, you got an awesome wetland in the middle of the rice country and no other huge refuge nearby. I mean, you're only game yeah. in town. It's yeah. recipe for success, right? It's always been that way. You know, that ranch, I think, has always been an attraction. Geographically, it's located in a spot where they want to be. Yeah. You know, so that's what's always made it so nice. It's quiet. Yeah. You know, yeah. they don't have a lot of pressure, and they, you know, they've imprinted there over the years, and Dad did manage it really Absolutely. well. Absolutely. You know, the the even when it was Butte Creek Gun Club, you know, there was off-limit areas to the ranch that were awesome for us to go hunt. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Dad. Yeah. And, uh, but it was, but he did. He, he managed it. He taught us how to manage, you know, um, the quiet areas. And, you know, you can have a big ranch and just going over there, you know, you didn't disturb him till the last week, you know, just how it was, you yeah. know, because he had a guide service going and he wanted it to be daily and for his members as well. So um, Rancho West Juan is just, that's that is that is the gem of the state, I think, too. I mean it's a beautiful place. Yeah. I mean, it still is. So Claude's done a great job with it. And Ramey and Anthony, yep. you know, managing yeah. it out there and you know, they, they knew how it needed to be ran when dad passed away and you know, they've honored that. Yeah. So and it's been it's a it's a beautiful place. Well, like you, we've had a bunch of youth hunts out there in the rice and stuff and yeah, some of the dads are just like that's just yeah. un, <clears throat> unreal, yeah. you know. So, be yeah, a part of that. It's cool. There's actually a YouTube video of uh, I forget who used to film out there. Jay Goble. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it Henley out there? And uh, if you if uh, they film one of my hunts, that's when, with you. Yeah. And I was like, that's hilarious. That's Jay. You can barely that. recognize that's me. That's awesome. But, yeah, yeah, I remember those. That videos. was at Esquan. I was like, I can't believe that full circle. Man. I was like, <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. I still watch it every once in a while. I'm like, that's so funny. I was nine, ten years old that's, at Esquan, and it got filmed. So that, that's so that's cool. probably one of my favorite memories. That's yeah. Cool. Now that's where our my high school trap team. You know, um, Mr. Hoffman. Right before he passed away, he 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 gave us the blessing so we could. We were starting a trap club at Durham High, and uh, he gave us the blessing. And unfortunately, we lost him a couple weeks later, and. Um, but then Lisa, his daughter, she, the following year, said, no, nah, no problem. And we rebuilt all the trap houses. And and uh, now Durham, that's their home base. And uh, it's awesome. You know, we have 37 kids out there. That's great. Right oh, in the great. high school, an awesome trap team. And uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, the ranch has had a lot of youth on it over the years. Yeah, yeah. from youth camps to hatchery tours, yeah. elementary kids coming out there. It's been 
phenomenal, you yeah. know. And you take anyone out there, even as an adult, and go to the egg salvage facility, and it's just it's one of those experiences that you don't you're always going to remember that, right? It's, right. You know, I want to say it's life changing, but everyone remembers that particular time that they abandoned a duck and released it, right? Oh, yeah. So pretty cool. Um, well, that's going to wrap it up for us, guys. I want to say thank you so much yeah. uh, for coming in. Rock, appreciate everything that you're doing for the waterfowl hunting community. Um, thank you, Jeff. Too. You, you've been on the forefront of things, so we appreciate you. And uh, Thanks for having just ha- me. Happy to see where you're at, man. <laughs> yeah. You were on the banning crew or was it around CWA, and now yeah. here you are, man. No, so I appreciate you having you. me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, guys. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, gents. Thank you for tuning in this episode at Save for the Blind podcast. You can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere podcasts are found.